Many of you know Dr. Hammond from his work and presentations. Um, I have his curriculum vitae and his list of selected topics and talks that he's given uh, spans about five pages. Um, it's a heavy-duty vitae. Um, you may be familiar with him also from his uh, recently published um, Hypnotic Metaphors book, a big red oversized book published by Norton uh, two years ago, which has the title of Big Red. <laughs> um, his education is that he took his B.S., M.S., and Ph.D. from the University of Utah, the Ph.D. in Counseling Psychology, Educational Psychology, and the Psychology Department. He is a diplomat in Clinical Hypnosis of the American Board of Psychological Hypnosis, a diplomat in Sex Therapy, the American Board of Sexology, a Clinical Supervisor and Board Examiner, American Board of Sexology, a diplomat in marital and sex therapy, the American Board of Family Psychology, a licensed psychologist in the state of Utah, and a licensed marital and family therapist. So you can tell this man has a lot of experience and a lot of varied experience. He currently serves as research associate professor, physical med medicine and rehabilitation, University of Utah School of Medicine. He is the director and founder, sex and marital therapy clinic, at the University of Utah. He has a private practice as a psychologist. He is an adjunct associate professor at the Educational Psychology Department at the University of Utah. In terms of his writing experience, he's the abstract editor for the American Journal of Clinical Hypnosis, a position he's held from 1986 to the present. He is the advisory editor and founding member of the editorial board of the Ericksonian Monographs, he is a referee of the American Journal of Clinical Hypnosis and the Journal of Abnormal Psychology and a reviewer and consultant to the National Center for Alcohol Education. He has received numerous professional honors, among them the Presidential Award of Merit of the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis in 1989 and the Urban Sector Award of the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis in 1990. In terms of his community activities um, of special interest to this conference is he's a member of the Governor's Task Force on Ritual Abuse, Commission for Women and Families in the State of Utah. And then finally, as I said, he has uh, a multitude of presenting and training and teaching experience. In addition to that, he is currently the president of the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis and a fellow of that organization. And as I get to his publications, he's published several books. But I can't find them. Among them, the Handbook of Hypnotic Suggestions and Metaphors, published in 1990, W.W. W. Norton, Learning Clinical Hypnosis and Educational Resources Compendium in 1988 and currently has a book in preparation and under contract to W.W. W. Norton, Integrative Hypnotherapy, a Comprehensive Approach. Dr. Hammond is known as a foremost authority in the field of hypnosis and also as a very well-regarded educator in the field. So I urge you to welcome him, and I know we'll have a good training day. Thank you. We've got a lot to cover today, and uh, let me uh, give you a rough, approximate outline of uh, the things that I'd like us to get into. First, let me ask, how many of you have had uh, at least one course or workshop on hypnosis? Can I see the hands? Wonderful. Okay. Makes our job much easier. Okay. Uh, I want to start off by talking a little about uh, trance training and the use of hypnotic phenomenon with uh, an MPD dissociative disorder population uh, to talk some about uh, unconscious exploration, methods of uh, doing that, the use of imagery and symbolic imagery techniques for managing physical symptoms, input overload, things like that. Before the day is out, I want to spend some time talking about something I think has been uh, completely neglected uh, in the field of dissociative disorders, 
and that's talking about methods of profound calming for autonomic hyperarousal that's been conditioned in these patients. We're going to spend a considerable length of time talking about age regression and ab reaction and working through a trauma. I'll show you with a non-MPD patient some of that kind of work and then extrapolate from that of what I would do similar and different with MPD cases. Part of that I would add, by the way, is that I've been very sensitive through the years about taping MPD cases or ritual abuse cases, part of it being that some of that feels a little like using patients, and I think that this population has been used enough, and that's part of the reason by choice that I don't uh, generally videotape my work with them. Also, I want to talk a bunch about uh, hypnotic relapse prevention strategies, uh, post-integration therapy today, and finally, I'm hoping to find somewhere in our time frame to spend an hour or so talking specifically about ritual abuse and about mind control programming and brainwashing, how it's done, how to get on the inside with that, uh, which is a topic that in the past I haven't been willing to speak about publicly. have done that in small groups and in consultations, but recently decided uh, that it was uh, high time that somebody started doing it. So we're going to talk about specific stuff. Let me suggest now, um, we've got still a lot to, to cover. I would like to request that we take a 20-minute break. At least what I'll tell you is we're supposed to have a 30-minute break. In 20 minutes, I'm going to start talking about ritual abuse mind control programming. For those of you who'd like a longer break, please feel free. For those of you who want other information, I'll see you in 20 minutes. and I'll give you as much as we can in about 45, 50 minutes on the topic. While well, being in Chicago at the first international uh, congress where ritual abuse was talked about. And I can remember thinking, how strange and interesting. And I can recall many people listening to an example given that somebody thought was so idiosyncratic and rare and all the people coming up after saying, gee, you're treating one too? Uh, you're in Seattle. Well, I'm in Toronto. Well, I'm in Florida. Well, I'm in Cincinnati. I didn't know what to think at that point. It wasn't too long after that, and I found my first ritual abuse patient in somebody I was already treating, and we hadn't gotten that deep yet. Things in that case made me very curious about the use of mind control techniques and hypnosis and other brainwashing techniques. So I started studying brainwashing and some of the literature in that area and became acquainted with, in fact, one of the people who had written one of the better books in that area. And um, then I decided to do a survey. And from some of the ISS and D folks, I picked out about a dozen and a half therapists that I thought were seeing more of that than uh, probably anyone else around, and I started surveying them. And the interview protocol that I had um, got the same reaction almost without exception. The therapist said, you're asking questions I don't know the answer to. You're asking more specific questions than I've ever asked my patient. Many of those same therapists said, let me ask these questions and I'll get back to you with the answer. Many of them not only got back with answers, but said, you've got to talk to this patient or these two patients, and I ended up doing um, hundreds of dollars worth of uh, telephone interviewing. What I came out of that with was a grasp of um, a variety of brainwashing methods being used all over the country. And I started to hear some similarities. And whereas I hadn't known to begin with how widespread things were, I was now getting a feel that there were a lot of people reporting some similar things and that there must be some degree of communication here. 
Then approximately two and a half years ago, I had some material drop in my lap. My source was saying a lot of things that I knew were accurate about some of the brainwashing, but was telling me new material I had no idea about. At this point, I took and decided to uh, check it out in, in three ritual abuse patients I was seeing at the time. Two of the three had what they were describing in careful inquiry without bleeding or contaminating. And the fascinating thing was that as I did a telephone consult with a therapist that I'd been consulting for for quite a number of months on an MPD case in another state, I told her to inquire about certain things. And she said, well, what are those things? And I said, I'm not going to tell you because I don't want there to be any possibility of contamination. Just come back to me and tell me what the patient says. She called me back two hours later, said I just had a double session with this patient. And there was a part of them that said, oh, uh, we're so excited. If you know about this stuff, you know how the cult programmers get on the inside and our therapy is going to go so much faster. Many other patients since have had a reaction of wanting to pee their pants out of anxiety and fear rather than thinking it was a wonderful thing. But um, the interesting thing was that she then asked, what are these things? They were word perfect, same answers that my source had given me and my own patients, two out of my three patients had given me. I've since repeated that in many parts of the country. I've consulted in 11 states and one foreign country in some cases over the telephone, in some cases in person, in some cases giving the therapist information ahead of time and saying, uh, be very careful how you phrase this, phrase it in these ways so you don't contaminate. In other cases, not even giving the therapist information ahead of time so they couldn't. And when you start to find the same highly esoteric information in different states and different countries, from Florida to California, you start to get an idea that there's something going on that is very large, very well coordinated with a great deal of communication and system, systematicness to what's happening. So I have gone from someone kind of neutral and not knowing what to think about it all to someone who clearly believes ritual abuse is real and that the people who say it isn't are either naive, like people who didn't want to believe the Holocaust, or they're dirty. Now, for a long time, I would tell a select group of therapists that I knew and trusted information and say, spread it out, don't spread my name, don't say where it came from, but here. Here's some information. Share it with other therapists if you find us on target, and I'd appreciate your feedback. People would question in talks and say, you know, they were hungry for information. Myself, as well as a few others that I'd shared it with, were hedging out of concern and out of personal threats and out of death threats. Uh, I finally decided to hell with it. If they're going to kill me, they're going to kill me. It's time to share more information with therapists. Um, and part of that comes because we proceeded so cautiously and slowly, checking things in many different locations and finding the same thing. So I'm going to give you the way in with ritual abuse programming. I certainly can't tell you everything you want to know in 45 or 50 minutes, but I'm going to give you the essentials to get inside and start working at a new level. I don't know what proportion, honestly, of patients have this. I would guess that maybe somewhere around at least 50 percent, maybe as high as three quarters, I would guess maybe two-thirds of your ritual abuse patients may have this. What do I think the distinguishing characteristic is if they were raised from birth in a mainstream cult or if they were a non-bloodline person, meaning neither parent was in the cult, but cult people had a lot of access to them in early childhood, they may also have it. I have seen um, a ritual, more than one ritual abuse patient who clearly had all the kind of ritual things you hear about. They seemed very genuine. Uh, they talked about all the typical things that you hear in this population, but had none of this programming with prolonged, extensive checking. And so I, I believe in one case that I was, I was personally treating that uh, she was from a kind of schismatic break-off 
uh, that had kind of gone off and done their own thing and were no longer hooked into a mainstream group. Here's where it appears to have come from. At the end of World War II, before it even ended, Alan Dulles and people from our intelligence community were already through Switzerland making contacts to get out Nazi scientists. As World War II ends, they not only get out rocket scientists, but they also get out some Nazi doctors who have been doing mind control research in the death camps. They brought them to the United States. Along with them was a young boy, a teenager, who had been raised in a Hasidic Jewish tradition and uh, a background of Kabbalistic mysticism that probably appealed to people in the cult because at least by the turn of the century, Aleister Crowley had been introducing Kabbalism into satanic stuff, if not earlier. And I suspect it may have formed some bond between them. But he saved his skin by collaborating and being an assistant to them in the death camp experiments. They brought him with them. And they started doing mind control research for military intelligence in military hospitals in the United States. And the people that came, the Nazi doctors, were Satanists. Subsequently, the boy changed his name, Americanized it some, obtained an MD degree, became a physician, and continued this work and appears to be at the center of the cult programming today. His name is known to patients throughout the country. What they basically do is they will get a child, and they'll start this in basic forms, it appears, by about two and a half, after the child's already been made dissociative. They'll make them dissociative not only through abuse, like sexual abuse, but also things like putting a mouse trap on their fingers and teaching the parents you do not go in until the child stops crying. Only then do you go in and remove it. Um, they start in rudimentary forms. At about two and a half and kicking back here to six or six and a half, continue through adolescence with periodic reinforcements in adulthood. Basically, in the programming, the child will be put typically on a gurney. They will have an IV in one hand or arm. They'll be strapped down, typically naked. They will have wires attached to their heads to monitor electroencephalograph patterns and they will see a pulsing light, most often described as red, occasionally white or blue. They'll be given most commonly, I believe, Demerol. Sometimes it'll be other drugs as well, depending on the kind of programming. They have it, I think, down to a science where um, they've learned you give so much every 25 minutes until the programming is done. They then, as they have that, will describe a pain in one ear, their right ear generally, where it appears a needle has been placed, and they will hear weird disorienting sounds in that ear, while they see photic stimulation, external psychic driving to drive the brain into a brainwave pattern with a pulsing light at a certain frequency, not unlike the goggles that are now available through sharper image and some of those kinds of stores. Then, after a suitable period when they're in a certain brainwave state, they will begin programming. Let me give you an example of one kind of programming oriented to self-destruction and debasement of the person. In a patient at this point in time, about eight years old, who has gone through a great deal, early programming took place on a military installation. That's not uncommon. I've treated and been involved with cases who were part of this original mind control project as well as having, having their programming uh, on military reservations in many cases. We find a lot of connections with the CIA. This uh, patient now was in a cult school, a private cult school, where several of these sessions occurred a week. She would go into a room, get all hooked up, they would do all of these sorts of things. And when she was into the proper altered state now, they were no longer having to monitor it with electroencephalographs. She also had already had placed on her electrodes, one in the vagina, for example, four on the head. Sometimes they'll be on other parts of the body. 
And they will then begin. And they would say to her, you are angry with someone in the group. She said, no, I'm not. And they violently shocked her. And they would say the same thing until she complied and didn't make any negative response. Then they would continue. And because you are angry with someone in the group, or when, when you are angry with someone in the group, you will hurt yourself. Do you understand? She said no, and they shocked her. They repeated it again. Do you understand? Well, yes, but I don't want to shock her again till they get compliance. And then they keep adding to it. And you will hurt yourself by cutting yourself. Do you understand? And maybe she'd say yes, but they might say, we don't believe you and shock her anyway. Go back and go over it again. And they would continue in this sort of fashion. She said typically it seemed as though they'd go about 30 minutes, take a break for a smoke or something, come back. They may review what they'd done and stop, or they might review what they'd done and go on to new material. She said the sessions might go a half an hour, they might go three hours. She estimated three times a week. Programming under the influence of drugs in a certain brainwave state and with these noises in one ear and them speaking in the other ear, usually the left ear associated with right hemisphere, non-dominant brain functioning, and with them taking, uh, uh, therefore, and requiring intense concentration, intense focusing, and because often they'll have to memorize and say certain things back word perfect to avoid punishment, shock, and other kinds of things that are occurring. This is basically how a lot of programming goes on. Some of it will also use other typical brainwashing kinds of techniques. There will be very standardized types of hypnotic things done at times. There will be sensory deprivation, which we know increases uh, suggestibility in someone. Not total sensory deprivation. Suggestibility has significantly increased from the research. It's not uncommon for them to use a great deal of that, including formal sensory deprivation chambers before they do certain of these things. Now, let me give you, because we don't have a lot of time, as much practical information as I can. The way that I would inquire as to whether or not some of this might be there would be with idiomotor finger signals after you've set them up. I would say... I want the central inner core of you to take control of the finger signals. Don't ask the unconscious mind. In the case where you're inquiring about ritual abuse, ask for the central inner core. The core is a cult-created part. And I want that central inner core of you to take control of this hand and of these finger signals, and when it has, for the yes finger to float up. Now, I want to ask that inner core of you, is there any part of you, any part of Mary, if that's the host's name, who knows anything about Alpha, Beta, Delta, or Theta? If you get a yes, it should raise a red flag that you might have some someone with formal intensive brainwashing and programming in place. I would then ask and say, I want a part inside who knows something about Alpha, Beta, Delta, and Theta to come up to a level where you can speak to me, and when you're here, say, I'm here. I would not ask if a part was willing to. <laughs> no one's going to particularly want to talk about this. I would just say, I want you to, some part who can tell me about this to come out. Without leading them, ask them what these things are. I've had consults where I've come in and sometimes I've gotten a yes to these. But as I've done exploration, it appeared to be some kind of compliance response or somebody wanting uh, in uh, two or three cases to appear maybe that they were ritual abuse or something. And maybe they were in some way. But with careful inquiry and looking, it was obvious that they did not have what we were looking for. Let me tell you what these are. Let's suppose that this whole front row here are multiples. And that she has a, an altar named Helen, she has one named Mary, she has one named Gertrude, she has one named 
Elizabeth, and she has one named uh, Monica. Every one of those altars may have put on it a program, perhaps designated Alpha 009. A cult person could say Alpha 009 or make some kind of hand gesture to indicate this and get the same part out in any one of them, even though it had they had different names that they may be known by to you. Alpha appear to represent general programmings, the first kinds of things put in. Beta appear to be sexual programs. For example, how to perform oral sex in a certain way, how to perform sex in rituals, having to do with producing child pornography, directing child pornography, prostitution. Delta are killers trained in how to kill in ceremonies, there will also be some self-harm stuff mixed in with that. Assassination and killing. Theta are called psychic killers. You know, I had never in my life heard those two terms paired together. I'd never heard the word psychic killers put together. But when you have people in different states including therapists inquiring and asking, what is theta? And patients say to them, psychic killers. It tends to make one a believer that certain things are very systematic and very widespread. This comes from their belief in psychic sorts of abilities and powers, including their ability to psychically communicate with mother, including their ability to psychically cause somebody to develop a brain aneurysm and die. It also is a more future-oriented kind of programming. Then there's Omega. I usually don't include that word when I say my first questions about, is there any part inside that knows anything about Alpha, Beta, Delta, Theta, because Omega will shake them up even more. And Omega has to do with self-destruct programming. Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. This can include self-mutilation, as well as killing themselves program. Gamma appears to be system protection and deception programming, which will provide misinformation to you, try to misdirect you, tell you half-truths, protect different things inside. There can also be other Greek letters. I'd recommend that you go and get your entire Greek alphabet, and if you have verified that some of this stuff is present and they have given you some of the right answers about what some of this material is, and I can't underline enough, do not lead them. Do not say, is this killers? <laughs> Get the answer from them, please. When you've done this and it appears to be present, I would take your entire Greek alphabet and with idiomotor signals go through the alphabet and say, is there any programming inside associated with Epsilon, Omicron, and go on through? There may be some systematicness to some of the other letters, but I'm not aware of it. I found, for example, in one case, Zeta had to do with the production of snuff films that this person was involved with. With another person, Omicron had to do with their linkage and associations with drug smuggling and with the mafia and uh, big business and government leaders. Um, so there's going to be some individualism, I think, in some of those. Some of those are come home programs, come back to the cult, return to the cult programs. Here's the flaw in the system. They have built in shut down and erasure codes. So if they got into trouble, they could shut something down and they could also erase something. These codes will sometimes be idiosyncratic phrases or ditties. Sometimes they will be numbers. 1428, 3621, 964. Maybe followed by a word. There's some real individuality to that. At first I had hope, gee, if we get some of these, maybe they'll work with different people. No such luck. <laughs> it's very unlikely unless they were programmed at about the same point in time as part of the same little group. 
stuff that I've seen suggests that uh, they carry laptop computers to the programmers, which still include everything that they did 20, 30 years ago in them in terms of the names of alters, the programs, the codes, and so on. Now, um, what you can do is get erasure codes. And I always ask, if I say this code, what will happen? Double check. Is there any part inside who has different information? Watch your radio motor signals. What I found that you can do is you can erase programs by giving the appropriate codes. But then you must abreact the feelings. So if you erase omega, which is often where I've started because it's the most high-risk area, afterwards I will get all the omega, what were formerly omega alters, together so that we will abreact and give back to the host the memories associated with all the programming that was done with Omega and anything any Omega part ever had to do in a fractionated ab reaction. They use the metaphor, and it is their metaphor of robots, and that it is like a robot shell comes down over the child altar to make them act in a robotic fashion. Once in a while, internally, you'll confront robots. What I found uh, from earlier work, and so I speed the process up now because I confirmed it enough times, is that um, if you, you can say to the core, core, I want you to look, there's this robot blocking the way in some way, blocking progress. Go around and look at the back of the head and tell me what you notice on the back of the head or the neck. I used to ask it very non-leading like that. And what was commonly said to me was that there were wires or a switch. And so I'll tell them, pull the wires or flip the switch and it will immobilize the robot. And give me a, a yes signal when you've done it. Pretty soon you get a yes signal. Great. Now that the robot is immobilized, I want you to open the robot and look inside and tell me what you see. There's generally one or several children. I have them remove the children and I do a little hypnotic magic and ask the core to vaporize, to use a laser and vaporize the robot so nothing is left. They're usually quite amazed that this works, as have been a number of therapists. Now, there are many different layers of this stuff is the, the problem. And let me come over to the overhead and uh, give some ideas about this. Okay. What we have up here are innumerable altars. I'll tell you one of the fascinating things I've seen. I remember a little over a year ago coming in to see some cases, some of the tough cases at a dissociative disorders unit of a couple of the finest MPD therapists in this country who are always part of all the international meetings, have lectured internationally. And as we work together, Get that into focus here. As we worked together, and uh, I looked at some of their patients, they were amazed at certain things because they had not been aware of this before. And as we worked with some of the patients and confirmed it there, I remember one woman who'd been inpatient for three years, still was impatient. Another who had one intensive year of inpatient work with all the finest MPD therapy you can imagine. Ab reactions, integrations, facilitating cooperation, art therapy, on and on and on. Journaling. Intensively for one inpatient year, followed by an intensive year of outpatient therapy, two, three hours a week. In both patients, we found out that all of this great work had done nothing but deal with the altars up here and had not touched the mind control program. And in fact, it was not only intact, but we found that... The one who was outpatient was having her therapy monitored 
every session by her mother out of state over the telephone. And that she still had intact suggestions that had been given to her at a certain future time to kill her therapist. Now, one of the things that I would very carefully check is I would suggest that you ask the core, not just the unconscious mind. Ask the core, is there any part inside that continues to have contact with people associated with the cult? Is there any part inside who goes to cult rituals or meetings? Is there a recording device inside of Mary, if that's the host's name? A recording device inside so that someone can find out the things that have been said in sessions. This doesn't mean they're monitored. Many of them just simply have it. Is there someone who debriefs some part inside for what happens in our therapy sessions? I have the very uncomfortable feeling from some past experience that when you look at this, you will find the larger proportion of ritual abuse victims in this country are having their ongoing therapy monitored. I remember a woman who came in in her, oh, about 24 years old, claimed she, her father was uh, a Satanist. Her parents divorced when she was six. After that, it would only be when her father had uh, visitation and he would take her to ritual sometimes. Up until age 15, she said, I haven't gone to anything since I was 15. Her therapist believed this at face value. We sat in my office. We did a two-hour inquiry using hypnosis. We found the programming present. In addition to that, we found out that every therapy session was debriefed. And in fact, they had told her to get sick and not come to the appointment with me. Another one had been told that I was cult and that uh, if I came, she would know that I'd been told not to come and I would punish her. If anything meaningful comes out in a patient who's being monitored like that, from what I've learned thus far, they're tortured with electric shocks. My belief is, if they're in that situation, you can't do meaningful therapy, other than being supportive and caring and letting them know you care a lot and you'll be there to support them. But I wouldn't try to work with any kind of deep material or deprogramming with them, because I think it can do nothing but get them tortured and hurt unless they can get into a safe, secure, inpatient unit for an extended period of time to do some of the work required. And I have a feeling that when you make inquiries, you're going to find that probably greater than 50% of these patients, if their bloodline, meaning mother or dad or both, involved, will be monitored on some ongoing basis. Now, when you come below the altars, you then have alpha, beta, delta, theta, so on and so forth, the Greek letter programming. And they will then have backups, backup programs. There will typically be an erasure code for the backups. There may be one code that combines all the backups into one and then an erasure code for them, or simply one code that erases all the backups. So I will get the code for, let's say, uh, omega. and um, for all the Omega backups at the same time. After I've asked about what will happen if I give this, I will give the code, and then I will say, what are you experiencing? They often describe computers whirring, things erasing, explosions inside, all sorts of interesting things. I've had some therapists come back and say, my Lord, I had never said anything about robots, and she said something about robots vaporizing. <laughs> I remember one therapist who had been with me in several hypnosis workshops consulted with me about a crisis MPD situation, and I told her to inquire about alpha, beta, delta, theta. She did. She got back to me. She said, yeah, I get an indication it's there. What is it? I said, I'm not going to tell you. Go back and inquire about some of this. And, and we set an appointment for a week or so hence. She got back with me. She said, I asked what uh, theta was, and she said, psychic killers. I asked what delta was. She said, killers. I said, okay. And so I told her about some of this stuff for a two-hour consult. She called back and she said, this seemed too fantastic. I heard this and I thought, has Corey been working too hard? She said, I'm embarrassed to admit it, but she said, I held you in high professional regard, but this just sounded 
so off in the twilight zone that I really thought, is he having a nervous breakdown or something? And she said, but I respected you enough to ask about this. She said, I asked another MPD patient and she didn't have any of this. But in this patient, she started describing things. And how she worked, for example, with an erasure and she was describing things like robots vaporizing and other kinds of things. But she said, I hadn't told her about any of these things. Well, here's the problem. There are different layers. And I think some of them are designed to keep us going in circles forever. They figured we probably, in most cases, wouldn't get below the altars, which they purposefully created. The way you create Manchurian candidates is you divide the mind. It's part of what the intelligence community wanted to look at. If you're going to get an assassin, if you're going to get somebody to go do something, you divide the mind. It fascinates me about cases like the assassination of Robert Kennedy, where Bernard Diamond, on examining Sirhan Sirhan, found that he had total amnesia for the killing of Robert Kennedy but under hypnosis could remember it. But despite suggestions he would be able to consciously remember, could not remember a thing after he was out of hypnosis. I'd love to examine Sir Hans Sir Hans. Um, it appears that below this we've got some other layers. One is called green programming, it appears. And isn't it interesting that the doctor's name is Dr. Green? One of the questions I'll ask in a way to not contaminate is, after I've identified some of this stuff is there and they've given me a few right answers about what some of it is, if there were a doctor associated with this programming and his name were a color, you know, like Dr. Chartreuse or something, if his name were a color, what would the color be? Now, once in a while, I've had some other colors mentioned in about three or four patients that I felt were trying to dissimulate in some way, and I don't really believe had this. In one case, I got another color, and I found out later it was a doctor with, who, whose name was a color who was being trained by Dr. Green almost 30 years ago, and he supervised part of the programming of this woman under this doctor. Remember, one woman couldn't come up with anything. No alter would speak up with anything. I said, okay. And we went on to some other material. About two minutes later, she said, Green. Do you mean Dr. Green? Um, we found this all over. There appears to be some green programming below that. And I suspect that it has a structure sort of like this, that you get down to fewer and more essential programs the deeper you go. Below green programming is ultra green. and the green tree. Kabbalistic mysticism is mixed all into this. If you're going to work with this, you need to pick up a couple of books on the Kabbalah. One is by a man named Dion Fortune, D-I-O-N Fortune, F-O-R-T-U-N-E, called the Kabbalah with a Q. Dion Fortune. Another is called is by Ann Williams hyphen Heller. Ann Williams Heller. And it is called uh, the Kabbalah with a K. K-A-B-B-A-L-A-H, I believe. It's a $10 quest book. Ann Williams Heller. H-E-L-L-E-R. Ann Williams Heller. The Kabbalah. K-A-B-B-A-L-A-H. I knew nothing about the Kabbalah. It was interesting. A patient had sat in my waiting area, um, got there considerably early, and drew a detailed, multicolored Kabbalistic tree over two years ago. And it took me two months to figure out what it was. Finally showing it to somebody else, he said, you know, that looks an awful lot like a Kabbalistic tree. And that rang a bell with some esoteric in an old book, and I dug it out. That was the background of Dr. Green. Now, the interesting thing about the green tree is his original name was Greenbaum. What does Greenbaum mean in German? Green tree. Ultra green and the green tree. I've also had patients who didn't appear to know that his original name was green volunteer that there were parts inside named green, Mr. Greenbaum. Now, let me give you some, uh, some information 
I'll just leave that up for a minute. Let me give you some information about parts inside that may be helpful to you. If you're going to inquire about these things. Because my experience is one part will give you some information and either run dry or get defensive or scared and stop. And so you punt and you make an end run and you come around the other direction and you find another part. I'll tell you several parts to ask for and ask if there's a part by this name. And by the way, when I'm screening patients that are fiddling around with this, I throw in a bunch of spurious ones and ask, is there a part inside by this name and by that name <laughs> as a check on whether or not it appears genuine. For example, in addition to the core, I ask, is there a part inside named wisdom? Wisdom is part of the Kabbalistic tree. Wisdom, I've often found, will be helpful and give you a... Is there a part inside named Diana? I mean, I may throw in all sorts of things. Is there a part inside named Zelda? I've never encountered one yet. <laughs> Just to see what kind of answers we get. I try and do this carefully. Diana is a part that in the Kabbalistic system is associated with a part called the foundation. You can be fascinated to know that, remember the process church? Uh, Roman Polanski's wife, Sharon Tate, was killed by the Manson family who were associated with the Process Church. And a lot of prominent uh, people in Hollywood were associated. And then they went underground, the book say, in about 78 and vanished. Well, they're alive and well in southern Utah. We have a thick file in the U.S. Uh, Utah Department of Public Safety documenting that they moved to southern Utah. North of Kanab, bought a movie ranch in the desert, renovated it, expanded it. Uh, built a bunch of buildings there, carefully monitored so that very few people uh, go out of there and um, no one can get in, and uh, change their name. And a key word in their name is foundation. The foundation, and there's some other words. And um, foundation is part of the tree. So you can ask, is there something inside known as the foundation? I might ask other things to throw people off. Is there something known as the sub-basement? <laughs> well, maybe they'll conceive of something else. Is there something known as the walls? There are a variety of questions you can come up with to sort of screen some things. I've also found that there will often be a part called Black Master, a part called Master Programmer, and that there will be computer operators inside. How many of you have come on to computer things in patients. There will typically be computer operators. Computer operator black, computer operator green, computer operator purple. Sometimes they'll have numbers and sets. Sometimes they'll be called systems information directors. And you can find out the head one of those. They'll often be a source of some information for you. I will ask inside, is there a part inside named Dr. Green? You'll find that there are if they have this kind of programming, in my experience. And usually with a little work and reframing, you can turn them and help them to realize that they were really a child part who's playing a role and they had no choice then, but they do now. And that they played their role very, very well, but that they don't have to continue to play it with you because they're safe here. And that in fact, if the cult simply found out that you talked to me, and that you had shared information with me, you tell me, what would they do to you? To emphasize that the only way out is through, and that they need to cooperate and share information and help me in the all of them. So all of these parts can give you various information. Now they have tried to protect this very carefully. Let me give you an example with Ultra Green. I've discovered this... Uh, by the way, I, I used to think this programming was only in non, or only in bloodline people. I've discovered it in bloodline people, but it's a bit different. They don't want it to be just the same. And I don't think you'll find deep things like ultra green, probably not even um, green programming at this deep, uh, or with non-bloodline people. 
But let me tell you something that I discovered first in a non-bloodline and then in a bloodline. We were going along, and a patient was close to getting well, uh, approaching final integration in a non-bloodline, and she suddenly started hallucinating. And her fingers were becoming hammers and other things like that. And so I used an affect bridge and we went back. And we found that what happened was that they gave suggestions that if she ever got well, got to a certain point, she would go crazy. And the way they did this was they strapped her down and they gave her LSD when she was eight years old. And then when she began hallucinating, they inquired about the nature of the hallucinations so they could utilize them in good Ericksonian fashion and build on them. And then combine the drug effect with powerful suggestions. If you ever get to this point, you will go crazy. If you ever get fully integrated and get well, you will go crazy like this and will be locked up in an institution for the rest of your life. And they gave those suggestions vigorously and repetitively. Finally, they introduced other suggestions that rather than have this happen, it would be easier to just kill yourself. In a bloodline patient then, as I began inquiring about deep material, the patient started to experience similar symptoms. We went back and we found that identical things were done to her. And this was called the green bomb, B-O-M-B. Lots of interesting internal consistencies, like that play on words with Dr. Greenbaum, his original name. Now, in this case, it was done to her at age nine for the first time. And then only hers was different. Hers was a suggestion for amnesia. If you ever remember anything about ultra green and the green tree, you will go crazy. You will become a vegetable and be locked up forever. And then finally the suggestions added and it would be easier to just kill yourself than have that happen to you. If you even remember it, at age 12 then, three years later, they used what sounds like an amatol interview to try to breach the amnesia and find out if they could. They couldn't. So then they gave her, strapped her down again, took and uh, gave her something to kind of paralyze her body, gave her LSD, an even bigger dose, and reinforced all the suggestions. Did a similar thing at the age of 16. So these are some of the kind of booby traps she'll run into. There are a number of cases where they've combined powerful drug effects like this with a suggestion to keep us from discovering some of this deeper level stuff. What's the bottom? Your guess is as good as mine. But I can tell you that I've had a lot of therapists who were stymied with these cases. They were going nowhere. In fact, someone here that I told some basic information about this to in Ohio a couple of months ago said it opened all sorts of things up in a patient who'd been going nowhere. And that's an often common thing. Um, I think that we can move down to deeper levels, and if we deal with some of the deeper level stuff, it may destroy all the stuff above it. But we don't even know that yet. And some of the patients I'm working with, we have pretty much dealt with a lot of the top level stuff, and I'll tell you how we've done some of that. We'll take and erase one system, like Omega. Then we will have a huge ab reaction of all the memories and feelings and a fractionated ab reaction associated with those parts. I typically find, and I'll say to them, now that we've done this, are there any other memories or feelings that any parts that were omega still have? The answer is usually no. At that point, I will say, I usually find that at this point in time, the majority, if not all, of those parts that used to be omega no longer feel a desire or need to be different, realizing that you were split off originally by them and want to go home to Mary and become one with her again. And I use the concept often now, which came from a patient of going home and becoming one with her. 
Going back from whence you came. This is another phrase I'll use for them. Are there any omega parts inside who do not feel comfortable with that? Or have reservations or concerns about that? If there are, we talk to them, we deal with them, a few may not integrate. My experience is most of the time they'll integrate, and we may integrate 25 parts at once in a polyfragmented complex MPD. I think it is vitally important to abreact the feelings before you go on. Also, many patients, it hasn't seemed to matter the order we go in, but I found a couple where it has. If it doesn't seem to matter, I'll typically go omega, then delta, because they have more violence potential, then gamma, to get rid of the self-deception stuff. If that isn't working, or, or rather... If, um, well, what, what I will do before I just assume anything and do that is once we've done Omega and showed them that success can occur and something can happen and they feel a relief after, I will say to them, uh, I want to ask the core through the fingers, is there a specific order in which programs must be erased? Now, maybe it doesn't matter, but is there a specific order in which they must be erased? Most of the time I found no. There are cases where we found yes. I recommend doing one or two or three of those because they'll produce relief and a sense of optimism in the patient. But then I would recommend starting to probe for the deeper level things and getting their input and recommendations about the order in which we go. Question. What has been the typical age and the typical gender of this type of person? I know of this being found in men and women. Most of the patients I know of MPD ritual abuse who are being treated are women, however. But I know of some men being treated where we've uh, found this. Um, a while back, I was talking to a small group of therapists somewhere. And I told them about some of this. And in the middle of talking about some of this, all the color drained out of one social worker's face. And she obviously had a reaction, and I asked her about it, and she said, I'm working with a six-year-old boy, no, five-year-old boy. And she said, just in the last few weeks, he was saying something about a Dr. Green. And I went on a little further, and I mentioned some of these things, and she just shook her head again. I said, what's going on? And she said, he's been spontaneously telling me about robots and about Omega. I think you will find variations of this and that they've changed it probably every few years and maybe somewhat regionally to throw us off in various ways. But that certain basics and fundamentals will probably be there. I have seen this in people up into their 40s, including people whose parents were very, very high in CIA, other sorts of things like that. I've had some that were originally part of the Monarch Project, which is the name of the government intelligence project. Question in the back. I'm still not grasping how one starts, how you find out how to erase. How do you get that information? I would say I want the core, if necessary, using the telepathic communication ability you have to read minds, because they believe in that kind of stuff, so I'll use it. I was trained in Ericksonian stuff, <clears throat> to obtain for me the erasure code for all Omega programs. And when you've done so, I want the yes finger to float up. Then I ask them to tell it to me. Are there backups for Omega programs? Yes. Okay. How many backups are there? Six. They say, let's say, uh, it's, it's different numbers. Is there an erasure code for all the backup programs? No. Is there an erasure code that combines all the backups into one? Yes. Obtain that code for me. When you've got it, give me the yes signal again. And it can move almost that fast in some cases where there's not massive resistance. Question. Yes, can you tell me uh, what you know about uh, risks to the therapist 
What kind of uh, data? You would have to ask. Yeah, I, I'd like to know that. What kind of data do you have, given that you've had uh, contact with large numbers of people? Uh, not just threats, but also uh, any injury, any uh, family problems that have arisen? And that's one question. The second one is, are you aware of anybody that you've treated or others with this level of, uh, of dissociation and trauma that have recovered, integrated, whole, and happy? I have one non-bloodline multiple, complex multiple, um, who have this kind of programming where they have a lot of access to the patient as neighbors and with a doctor. By the way, you'll find physicians heavily involved. They've encouraged their own to go to medical school, to prescribe drugs, to take care of their own, to get access to medical technology and be above suspicion. Uh, there have been a couple, in fact, in Utah who have been nailed now. We now in Utah have two full-time ritual abuse investigators with statewide jurisdiction under the Attorney General's office to do nothing but investigate this. Okay. And in a poll done in the state of Utah in January by the major newspaper and television station, they found that 90% of Utahns believe that ritual abuse is genuine and real. Not all of them believe it's a frequent occurrence, but some of that in part from two years of work by the Governor's Commission on Ritual Abuse, interviewing, talking, meeting people, gathering data. And when people say, by the way, there's no evidence, they've never found a body, that's baloney. They found a body in Idaho of a child. They've uh, had a case last summer that was convicted on first-degree murder charges, two people that the summer before that were arrested where the teenage girl's finger and head were in the refrigerator. And they were convicted of first-degree murder in Detroit. There have been cases and bodies. Back to risk. I know of no therapist who's been harmed. Just inform us that there will come a future time where we could be at risk of being assassinated by parts of, of patients who have been programmed to kill at a certain time. Uh, anyone that they hold in any number of our families is not active. If that would come out, is speculative. Who knows? For sure. Maybe. I, I, I don't think it's entirely without this. Question about that. Um, it seems to me that. I hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not used to talking to the microphone. Um, it, it seems to me that there are some similarities between. Yes. 
What's the difference between this kind of program and cult type abuse and satanic abuse and the kind of cults with the candles and the... These, this type of programming will be done in the cults with candles and all of the rest. My impression is this is simply done in people where they have great access to them or their bloodline and their parents are in it where they can be raised in it from an early age. If they are bloodline, they are the chosen generation. If not, they are expendable and they are expected to die and not get well. And there will be booby traps in your way if they're non-bloodline people that when they get well, they will kill themselves. And I'll, I'll tell you just a little about that. But my belief is that some people that have ritual abuse and don't have this have been ritually abused, but they may be part of a non-mainstream group. The Satanism comes in in the overall philosophy overriding all of this. People say, what's the purpose of it? My best guess is that the purpose of it is that they want an army of Manchurian candidates. Tens of thousands of mental robots who will do prostitution, do child pornography, smuggle drugs, engage in international arms smuggling, do snuff films, all sorts of very lucrative things and do their bidding. And eventually, the megalomaniacs at the top believe, create a satanic order that will rule the world. One last question, then I'll give you a couple more details, and we need to shift gears. You have suggested or implied that at some point, at a high level of the U.S. government, there was support for this kind of thing. I know we're short of time, but can you just say a few words about the kind of documentation that may exist for that suggestion? There isn't great documentation of it. It comes from victims who are imperiled witnesses. Um, the interesting thing is how many people have described the same scenario and how many people that we have worked with who have had relatives in NASA, in the CIA, and in the military including uh, very high ups in the military. Um, I can tell you that a friend of a colleague of mine who has probably the equivalent of uh, half the table space on that far side of the room uh, filled with boxes with uh, declassified documents from mind control research done in the past that has been able to be declassified over a considerable couple of decade period. Um, and has read more government documents about mind control than anyone else, uh, has a brief that has literally been sent in in the past week and a half uh, asking for all information to be declassified about the Monarch Project for us to try and find out more. Now, let me just mention something about uh, some of the stuff that you will, my experience is in several patients now that you may run into late in the process. I know I'm throwing a lot at you in a hurry. Some of it is completely foreign, and some of you may think, uh, gosh, could any of this be true? Just, you know, ask. Find out in your patients, and you may be lucky, and there isn't any of this. Um, somewhere at a deep level, you may run on to some things like this. Let me describe to you, find my hand, the system in one patient. One patient I had treated for quite a while, a, a non-bloodline person, and uh, we had done what appeared to be successful work and reached final integration. And she came back to me uh, early last year and said, um, she was symptomatic with some things. I started inquiring. I found a part there we'd integrated. The part basically said there was other stuff that I couldn't tell you about, and uh, you integrated me, and, and uh, uh, so I, I had to split off. I'd done some inquiring about things like Alpha Beta as a routine part of it, and found they were there. And I said to this part, why didn't you tell me about this stuff? And she said, well, we gave you some hints, but they went right over your head. <laughs> If I'm sorry, <laughs> well, we knew that you didn't know enough to help us, but now we know that you can. <laughs> and so stuff started coming out. 
It was interesting. She described the overall system, if I can remember it now, as being like this. The circle represented harm to the body. A system of altars whose primary purpose was to hurt her, including symptoms like Munchausen's, uh, self-mutilation, other kinds of things. Each of the triangles represented still another different system. She said, with the exception of me, this one part, you dealt with the whole circle with the work that we did before, but you didn't touch the rest of the stuff. Okay. In the middle of all this was still another system, consisting of the Kabbalistic tree, which some of you are aware looks approximately like this, with lines in between, and so on and so forth. There's a rough approximation. That represented another system. And then once we got past that, she implied that this entire thing was somehow encompassed by, what do you call it, an hourglass. And I kept thinking we were at final integration. And then I find some other parts. This person had an eagle eye husband who was watching for certain things that we found to be reliable indicators. And so often, I would get evidence of dissociation within a few days that would be subtly picked up. And what we found uh, was I continued to find evidence of dissociation. And I'd find parts, and finally this part, as I kind of got angry with him and said, why, when I give these idiomotor inquiries, am I getting lied to? And this part said, because you don't understand. You're going to get us all killed. And we started talking, and she basically said, it's been programmed so that if you succeed and think you've succeeded, you will fail. They build it in as a way to laugh at you. That if you ever get us integrated, we will die. And here's what she said. This part said, I'm one of 12 disciples. And I found this in others. 12 disciples within this hourglass. Each of whom had to memorize a disciple lesson, which were basic satanic kind of premises and philosophies of life. Like, be good to those who hurt you. Hate those who are nice to you. On and on and on. There may be two or three sentences like that associated with each. They'd had to memorize them. And they said, we are like grains of sand falling. And when the last grain of sand falls, there's death. I said, is death a part? Yes. When the last grain of sand falls, the sleeping giant awakens. Sleeping giant was death, who was then to kill them on day one or day six after awakening, unless certain things were followed, and we did some of those. Well, we also found death had a sister as a backup, used with mirrors to create the sister part. We had to get past and deal with that, too. And then we found, and by the way, death had certain things that they said had to be done for them to integrate. And I started to say, oh, come on. They lied to you before, and she said, wait a minute, this is what they said you'd say. They said that no doctor would ever believe that they had to go to these extremes to get us well, and that's why it's part of the reason they fail. I said, well, tell me, tell me again. She said, I have to be dressed all in red. I have to have Demerol on board. I've taken Demerol. I have to... Uh, a code has to be given, and it has to be in a room that's totally dark. And it has to happen on day one or day six, after this part has been awakened. I said, what do I got to lose? That's a psychiatrist, give her a little Demerol. We used the code. My office didn't have any windows anyway. <laughs> it was pretty easy. Oh, and there had to be uh, a couple, three or four, four, I think, candles lit. Well, fine. So we did it, and everything went well. Maybe it would have gone well if we hadn't done it, but I decided not to take a chance. And to trust the patient, maybe. Well, so we go on, and then we find another part. There's death and destruction. Another backup, also with a sister. 
that we had to get through. In fact, I think there were two backups there. And interestingly, the very last part was an extremely nice part, made especially that way so that they wouldn't want to lose them, because they would be so adorable and so loving and so sweet that they wouldn't want to maybe get rid of them. And then we found that she continued to have these feelings with this last part left now of darkness and blackness inside. What did we find? A curtain. She said, they assumed that if you ever got to this point, you would, and along the way, by the way, we had encountered the stuff about the LSD stuff, the Green Bomb program. And the message was that, um, she said, there is a curtain behind which are the remaining feelings and memories. But it can't be opened from the middle. It's like a stage curtain. It has to be opened this way. But it can't be opened. They assumed that you would deal with all the, try and deal with all the feelings. It, that can't be opened until you've dealt with that last part and they've integrated. And so far it looks like we've got integration that's holding. So, I found death and destruction and the hourglass in non-bloodline. The tree and the hourglass, this patient informed me, were made of sand because we were meant to die. We're expendable. We're the unchosen generation. I've heard variously that it's crystals or blood that fill the hourglass in bloodline people. And by the way, you can do real simple things like turn the hourglass on its side so nothing can fall out, so time stands still to be able to do certain kinds of work, uh, spread the grains of sand on the seashore so that they can't be numbered, and the time will uh, not be counted. Uh, got that idea from a ritual abuse victim who had seen some of this kind of programming done that uh, another therapist uh, was seeing. So those are maybe just a few other hints about things that may be helpful or meaningful. But we're talking about very intensive kinds of things. And um, at deep levels. But to me, this gives us two good things. The one thing it gives to me is hope. Because it gets the material... And it makes progress like nothing else we have ever seen with these people who have it. The second thing that does for me is to demoralize me too. Because I thought three years ago I had a pretty good idea about the extent and breadth of what they've done to these victims. I had no real appreciation for the depth and the breadth and intensity of what they've done. And I want to come back to the other question over here now. The question is, how many of them can get well? We don't know. Well, most things in the mental health profession, we accept the two thirds of patients are in the group, and it's 70%. There's very little we can get everybody well. I think one of the sad things we have to face is that many of these patients will probably never get well. My personal belief is that if they are being messed with, their only hope of getting well is if they can somehow get out of contact. Now, I know patients who have gone to other states and simply have deep level authors pick up a phone and call and say, this is our new address and phone number, so they can be picked up locally. I mean, in an inpatient unit for an extended period of time. If they are in a cult from their area and they're still being monitored and messed with, my own personal opinion is we can't get them well and can't offer more than humanitarian caring and supportiveness. Lots of therapists do not like to do that. That's my opinion. I believe that if somehow they're lucky enough to be wealthy enough to have protection, to have somehow gotten away in some way, and we can work with them without being messed with, that they have a chance to reach some semblance of normality and livability with enough intensive work. My own personal belief is I don't think anybody with this kind of programming is well in this country yet. There are some who are well along the, lo the way. I've got a couple who are well along in their work and have done a tremendous amount, but they're clearly not well yet. <clears throat> Could you speculate on the relationship between this stuff and the 
fantasy games that have been proliferating, Dungeons and Dragons and that sort of thing? Well, there are a lot of things out there to cue people. You want to see a great movie, interesting movie to cue people? Go see Transfers 2. You can rent it in your video shop. It came out about last fall. One night in sheer desperation for something at the video store, you know? Nine o'clock on Friday night, everything's gone. <laughs> I rent a couple of movies, and one of them is that. Fascinating. They're talking about a green world order. Yes, Transfers 2. And who is the production company? Full Moon Productions. I couldn't see much queuing in Transfers 1, but who is the production company on Transfers 1? Alter Productions. <laughs> there are lots of things around that are queuing. There's an interesting person in the late 60s who talked about the Illuminati. Have any of you ever heard of the Illuminati with regard to the cult? I had a patient bring that up with me just about exactly two years ago. And we've now had other stuff come out from other patients. It appears to be the name of the international world leadership. There appear to be Illuminati councils in several parts of the world and one internationally. The name of the international leadership of the cult, supposedly. Is this true? Well, I don't know. It's interesting we're getting some people who we're trying to work without queuing who are saying some very similar things. There's an old guy in Hollywood in the late 60s who talked about the infiltration of Hollywood by the Illuminati. And certainly what some patients have said is all of this spook stuff, horror stuff, the possession and everything else that's been popularized in the last 20 years in Hollywood is in order to soften up the public so that when a satanic world order takes over, everyone will have been desensitized to so many of these things, plus to continually cue lots of people out there. Is that true? Well, I can't definitively tell you that it is. What I can say is, I now believe that ritual abuse programming is widespread, is systematic, is very well organized from highly esoteric information, which is published nowhere, has not been on any book or talk show that we have found all around this country in at least one foreign country. Let's take a couple of quick questions, and we need to get on to other material. Yes? Do you have any techniques for decreasing the level of uncertainty that a patient, you can't do it grammatically, but a patient is or is not being still tampered with, messed with, as you, as you said? Just that I would ask several of the parts I've inquired about. Core, Diana, Wisdom, Master Programmer, several parts inside I would ask about these sorts of things. And I will keep asking it. As you do additional work and get a bit further, I would ask again to find out. In the back. I wonder if you've heard or you know of the Martin Luther bloodline. The what? Martin Luther bloodline. I know nothing about the Martin Luther bloodline. I'll give you one other quick tip. Ask them about an identification code. There's an identification code that people have. It will involve their birth date. It may involve places where they were programmed. And it will usually involve uh, a number in, in there that will be their birth order, like 02 if they were second born. And it will usually involve a number that represents the number of generations in the cult if they are bloodlines. I've seen up to 12 now. Twelve generations. Uh -huh. uh, I have I've seen uh, a lot of the things you've been describing today in, in several patients. I wanted to ask you a question about the uh, seven systems. Uh, you mentioned something about systems here. Uh, are there seven systems? There have been that described in some patients. Yes, the seven systems. Could you say what that is, or a little about? I don't think we know enough to know what it is. Honestly. I think it may have to do with seven Kabbalistic trees. Huh? Have you ever had any evidence where any of these people have been tagged or has there been anything on their body parts um, that might be related to this? Private parts in particular. Well, there's certainly people that have had tattoos that have had a variety of other kinds of things, some of which have been you know, documented in cases. But, I mean, to say, you know, well, maybe they did that to themselves or had it done consciously, I mean, to, to really prove something. Uh, not that occurs to me right off the bat. One la let me just take this one last question back. We need to go on to other material because we're never going to get through it all. Let me just ask you to hold your question. Uh-huh. Uh, not a question, but I wanted to say, uh, 
for myself personally and perhaps for others here as well, I wanted to thank you very sincerely for choosing this time to come forward. Well. Uh, a dear friend who's one of the top people in the field, who I know has had death threats, but I know struggled for professional credibility in believing in MPD, and was harshly criticized for even believing in that 10 and 15 years ago, and struggled to a point of professional credibility. I think in his heart of hearts, he knows it's true, but he will say things like, I wouldn't be surprised to find tomorrow it was an international conspiracy, and I wouldn't be surprised to find tomorrow that it is an urban myth and rumor. He tries to stay right on the fence. And I think the reason is because it's controversial, because there is a campaign underway saying these are all false memories induced by, along with incest and everything else, by Oprah and by books like The Courage to Heal and by naive therapists using hypnosis. And it's controversial. My personal opinion has come to be, if they're going to kill me, they're going to kill me. There's going to be an awful lot of information that's been put away that will go to investigative reporters and multiple investigative agencies if it happens. And an awful lot of people like you, I hope, that if I ever have an accident, will be uh, pushing for a very large-scale investigation. I think we have to stand up out of some kind of moral conscience at some point. And I tried to wait until we had gotten enough verification from independent places to have some real confidence that this was widespread. I know we've gone like a house of fire to try and pack as much as I could in for you. I hope it's given you some things to think about and some new ideas, and I appreciate being with you. Okay. Okay, we're going to make this the last question, and uh, then we're going to go to the imagery. Uh, do you deal with uh, ritual uh, abuse survivors who have knowingly walked out of the cult and knowingly uh, understand what they have done? And how do you deal with the addictions that they come out with? Um, did everyone hear that question? Okay. Um, and you're talking about adults, people who have left the cult as adults. Uh, adult cult members who yeah. are still in have, and are wanting to come out. Do you uh, set up and work with these people, and how do you handle the addictions that they come out with? I've never worked with anybody who came into my office and says, I've just walked out of a cult, I want help. Mm-hmm. No one has decided. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, mo- mostly I've worked with folks that this has been uncovered. They've been amnestic for it um, for quite a while in therapy before they even come up with it. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that... Um, what you're what you're working with there is a perpetrator. I mean that you need to do perpetrator treatment with a multiple or, or whatever, um, but um, that you have to address the perpetration behavior before you can, you know, treat them just as a survivor. Um, and of course, you know, their own abuse is going to be a part of the perpetrator. Treatment. Um, did you go to Mark Schwartz's workshop? Okay. Um, get that tape. Okay. Mark Schwartz did one on sexual compulsivity, and um, he's he talks about treating perpetrators, and he gives a case example of someone who came in with um, uh, what he thought was just going to be compulsive masturbation, and uh, it turned out he had a, a cult member. Um, and so I, I think that tape would be real interesting. I think with the addictions, I was thinking more of the compulsive blood drinking, uh, you know, besides the sexual compulsivity, the other addictions uh, that come with it uh, and that kind of behavior. Well, I think you work with those kinds of compulsions in the same way that you work with hand-washing compulsions. Yeah. You know, it, it's the same process yeah. to work with or... Um, or if you're coming at it from an addiction standpoint, to work with it that way. Um, sometimes medication like anaphronil is useful in curbing compulsion 
obsessive compulsion components. Um, but other than that, you're going to do, excuse me, and try, try what? Naltrexone. Um, there's been limited success with naltrexone, which is an opioid uh, receptor blocker, so that they don't get the endorphin release <coughs> with a behavior like cutting that um, that gives them a high from doing it, that gives them the physiological reinforcement to do it again. Yeah. I mean to say, one, someone asked a, a question about working with addictions um, during the break, too, and, and the other thing I want to say about that is that you have to find out which alters have the addictions um, and work with those alters, and um, then you've also got to contract about um, the other parts not sabotaging the recovery, um, contracting around um, which parts need to go to AA meetings or NA meetings, whatever, and um, and how other parts are going to help them get there. You know, who's going to be present when? That you really have to have a lot of contracting in place. 